Before the Rings of Power, there were the Silmarils. Before Sauron, there was his master, Morgoth. Before Aragorn and Arwen, there was Beren and Luthien. Welcome to Window on the West, where we explore all the ages of Tolkien's Middle-earth. With your hosts, Jonathan Watson, Michael Grumbine, and Dan Coates. Welcome to the second part of the best story in the Silmarillion of Tour and Tour and Bar. Hey, we're on the second part. Now look at the, those smirks if you're watching us on YouTube or Rundle. Those smirks of Dan and Michael looking at me like, well, is he's gonna keep going on with this? Like it's the best second. Anyway, uh, if you wanna hear about how I think it's the best story, you should become a, you should become a patron and come, uh, come join us in our Discord and uh, listen to the extended podcast which you get by going to the com patron for $4 a month and the first month is free. Like I say, every gosh darn cotton picking week. Am I allowed, sorry, am I allowed to say cotton picking? Are we, is that something disallowed? That's problematic. It is problematic? Yeah. Shoot. Sorry. Sorry that, to tell you guys, the, our the, entire podcast the, is problematic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you want to support this problematic podcast, please go to thewondering.com slash patron and become a member and get our extended podcast on your podcast player or through uh, uh, YouTube. You can get it there too. Uh, we, we post our links to that uh, on both the webpage and the Discord chat. And uh, you can also become a member on uh, YouTube by clicking the join button down, down, down over here, down below, somewhere over there, uh, so that we can uh, uh, you you can pay pay YouTube some extra money and not get a first month for free. So I sh I encourage you go to thewarning.com slash patron. Don't give YouTube the money. Sorry, YouTube. Don't don't ban me. Uh, all right. So speaking of Discord and, and all that sort of stuff, it, 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 for this week's edition of All That Is Gold Does Not Glitter. Um, we've got, uh, the memes today. So, uh, our, uh, our discord chat. So you guys, will, you guys who, uh, don't, don't get a peek into our discord chat because you're, you aren't members. Um, we've been posting a few memes. And so, uh, here are a few that, that, that came up here. Let me see if I can zoom in anymore. No, that's the most I can zoom in on this screen. Uh, so here we go. We've got the first picture. It says it's, uh, the top half is girls. The bottom half is boys. There's a, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, just a drawing of a blonde girl that says, I can't believe he didn't cry at the Titanic. And then another girl says, do men even have feelings? And then there's a picture of the boys with the children of Hurin, uh, cover. Mm -hmm. And to the right is a, is a stricken boy, a man. Well, I don't, is there a name for this, uh, this drawn character that, that that's, in the memes? that's, that's Chad, Chad, right? Sorry. Mm -hmm. So Chad with a darkened face. So. Do we cry at the children of Hurin or do you cheer Hurin on? It all depends on your quality of life. Uh, I, don't know. I like this next one best. This, this meme is awesome because I can just read it and it's funny. This is a Tolkien math problem. So let me read this to you. This is oh, no. <laughs> so here, here, let me read this to you. Turin runs from Doriath to Dor Loman at a rate of 30 miles a day. Morwen and Ninior, uh, Ninio, Ninor, sorry, walk from Dor Loman to Doriath at a rate of 15 miles a day. Consulting a map of Beleriand, please answer how many horrific mistakes Turin will make on this journey and how many innocent <laughs> lives will be lost. Show your work. <laughs> That's so fantastic. True. <laughs> That's so true. Oh, I love that one. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then here we go. Here's uh, a, a picture of a mug with a four leaf clover on it that says uh, that uh, Naya, I believe, wrote, right? This is Naya. Yeah, she wrote, uh, I'm finally to give Jonathan the love from his kids, which says, I'm as lucky as Turin Turinbar, which I, I don't think I want for my kids. I didn't say I liked what happened to the guy. I like the story. Oh, oh, goodness. My gosh, I can't like. Well, it's better than getting it from your wife. <laughs> huh. I'm trying to, I don't want to read into that too much. Yeah. Yeah. My don't. wife, that, like that's, that's, uh, let's not go down that road. Uh, wow. Well, we're about to go down that road. That's the yes, problem. Yes, we are. That is true. All right. La last one. Uh, and this is, uh, one more. It's a picture of, uh, Turin on the left and on the right. It says, if thou love me, leave me. And that's, uh, everyone who ever met Turin Turinbar. That's, <laughs> that's pretty true. That's what Gwyndor actually says, right? If thou love me, leave me, I think. Mm hmm uh and then i love that that mandy wrote here uh there are so many memes here oh I and was, meme I, spelled uh, m-i-m uh, like meme the petty dwarf who nobody likes except me see i was gonna make a bad joke when you said you were, we were gonna look at memes and i, I, held, <laughs> off, I held i held off <laughs> it's like good. thank you for I'm, giving me the opportunity i'm to, getting ready for just a whole swath of ugly dwarf, dwarf faces <laughs> on the on the screen in front of me 
so yeah so th those are funny so if you uh if you want to see more of those uh go to the onewing.com slash patron you can join us in discord for a month and just just read the memes and then cancel if you want to uh all right read so, the memes but never trust the meme yeah huh. mm -hmm. these are petty memes these little memes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh man, we can keep going forever with lest the they forget are. that we are all fathers. <laughs> we are right. all Sorry dads. about all the dad jokes. Please don't don't thumb us down or don't give us a negative review. If your dad give us a positive review and and uh, or if you are going to give us a negative review, jokes. at least make it about Turin. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Turin is great. Turin the story is great. Not Turin the character, Turin the story. Okay, speaking of Turin the story, we're going to let's let's get into it. When um, we last left him. When we last left Turin. Uh and uh there's a lot. So we, we last left him they were on the way to Nargothron, but uh as per is our usual way, Dan's going to uh throw up as he so eloquently put earlier his big thought. So Dan's big thought. Okay, so if you didn't get your Bible Devo time in, <laughs> let the story of Turin teach you, do not listen to the dragon. So I'm going to make this like an allegory for like spiritual matters in your life. What? You're not yeah. allowed to make Tolkien an allegory <laughs> match up. I, I'm, I'm just watching Michael Twitch <laughs> over there. So, okay. So in this tale. I'm going to go on I mean, mute. <laughs> <laughs> in this tale, you have uh, a part of the story where um, uh, Turin is facing down with Glaurung, the dragon. And we find out that Glaurung can use his eyes kind of like in uh, Alice in Wonderland. He's kind of hypnotic and he kind of puts you in a trance and he can kind of speak to you and tell you things and, and weave in lies and deceit and, and also accusations that are probably well-founded. But he, he he's very much like a like a, a accuser character, like the, the like, kind of like Lucifer in the Bible like, of the, of the Satan character. He's, he basically brings up, you know, evil have all your ways been son of Horan, thankless fosterling outlaw slayer of your friend, thief of love, usurper of Nargothrond, captain foolhardy and deserter of thy kin. Um, as thralls, thy mother and thy sister live in Dor Loman in misery and want. You are arrayed as a prince, but they go in rags, and for you they yearn, but you care not for that. Uh, glad may thy father be to learn that he has such a, fa has such a son, as sh learn he shall. And Turin, being under the spell of Glaurung, hearkened to his words, and he saw himself as in a mirror, misshapen by malice, and loathed that which he saw. So I guess you have uh, an opportunity of... Uh, you know, kind of like what Martin Luther said, when the, when the devil throws your sins in your face, you can respond one of two ways. You can say, you know what, you're right. Um, but I, I know somebody who, who atoned for me. Uh, but if you're in the, the spell of the dragon and you're listening to the, 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 the dragon basically set your narrative, hmm. uh, Turin is there going, yep, yep. He's looking in a mirror and he just sees himself and he hates what he sees. And I thought that that was an interesting that, that, that moment jumped out to me anyway. Hmm. And, and in this story, there is, there is no one to, well, other than if the person offers you forgiveness, there is no redemption in a way for yeah. humans yet. Based right. on Tolkien's, uh, according to Austin Freeman, the way he approached it in our interview with him, I think. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. That's our sermon for today, guys. We're going to shut it down and think on it for a while. <laughs> I'm going to pass the basket around. <laughs> I don't know. What does the Catholic think about that? Hmm. Well, good thing I was on mute during the Martin Luther part. <laughs> uh, no. So I, from a myth perspective, uh, the whole dragon mesmerization, hypnotization, uh, telling you, giving you false images and lies... I mean, we see it in a lot of places. It's even even made it to Disney, which Tolkien loves so much. So the Jungle Book, um, the snake in the Jungle Book, the snake in uh, Ricky Tikki Tavi. So the serpent is always mm -hmm. has a has a power to to basically um, keep you from doing what you're supposed to be doing. And what's really interesting is this: this is, I mean, Glaurung becomes a character in this one. It, 
before we saw him, he was just twice he's appeared and he was just sort of a, an engine of war. He was used as a weapon. Now he becomes a character with motivations and malice and an instrument of Morgoth um, in a direct way. Yeah. And, and he takes the central part. What was interesting I was noticing is in our split, we stopped after last week and the, and I know, I know the way I'm going to say it's going to sound weird, but bear with me. Okay. The only terrible thing that had happened up to that point for the first third of the story is Turin kills his friend. So it's a terrible thing, but, but we're about to get to go to 11 in terms of the tor the, the terrible things that, that happen. And they all happen in the second part of the story yeah. and they are all machinations. We, we talk about Turin and his flaws, which he has plenty, but, they are primarily driven by the machinations of Morgoth through Glaurung. Oh, yeah. So this is really, this is almost like a movie setup where we have a, we have a big bad guy and we have a, a hero, although the hero um, has tragic flaws and ultimately doesn't end well. Yeah. And, and, and I think before we, um, before we started recording too, you mentioned that this, uh, this chapter or this part of the, uh, this this second half, so to speak, of of this chapter is di divided in two parts: in Nargothrond and then with Glaurung, right? Everything that happens with Glaurung. And so let's, I think we we can talk about what happens in uh, in Nargothrond because he Gwyndor takes him there, and Turin, as Tolkien writes, grew high in favor with Ordreth, and well nigh all hearts were turned to him in Nargothrond, which I found really interesting because. It means he was, people were attracted to him. They wanted to be with him, right? They, they loved him despite all of his issues. Somehow he was able to put on an air of being a, a hero in that sense. And people were drawn to him. At least that's how I read it. Unless. Well, he's a leader of men, right? Yes. So right. he's, he's almost like the antithesis of Aragorn. He's like the dark side of Aragorn. Wherever he goes, when he was an outlaw, he became the leader of outlaws, right? When he yeah, was right. on the war, on the marches, he became a leader, a war leader with Beleg. When now that he's in Nargothrond, he becomes, in fact, he kind of usurps power from Orodreth and becomes the center of attention and a leader of armies and changes their whole strategy with regard to fighting Morgoth, much to their misfortune in the end. But, um, and then later on, he becomes a leader of the men in the woods. And mm -hmm. so um, there are, he is a leader. He is a born leader. He has that charisma. It's, we see all of his flaws, but he also has this magnetic personality clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, which I think, I, and for him, it, it never came across to me that as like, he's a leader, but he's also somebody people liked. Mm -hmm. you, you can, you can be an unliked leader and you can just take control, but he's not that he's not, you know, a Sauron type. No, I mean, that's the, the extreme, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, uh, but yeah, is there is I, I don't want to go through this step by step because so much is written there. And I think Dan, uh, Dan pointed out like, you know, he is corrupted by um, the lies spoken about him, but he's also corrupted in, in a sense by the love that people have for him because he he what right, right Gwyndor ended up like having issues a little bit with him because Findwalas, who Gwyndor loved, fell in love now with uh, with with Turin. Uh, and then when, when, uh, when Gwyndor speaks his name, he says, doubt not the power of Morgoth Bauglir, is it not written in me? So he's already accepting, like he's accepted his doom almost in a way at that point. Like, I think he, he sees it coming in where, where he writes later is like, uh, the, um, the steps of his doom were approaching him, were, were nearing him or something like that. I can't remember the exact line. Uh, one of my favorite lines, actually, but I didn't memorize it. Yeah, and the interesting thing about uh, Finduilas was um, she. It's, there's this line which says, "Then the heart of Finduilas was turned from Gwyndor, and against, against her, her will, her, will uh, yeah. her love was given to Turin, but Turin did not perceive what had befallen." Turin actually has two loves in this story: uh, Finduilas, and then um, someone else. We're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, um. And so, it, and it is, it, and it's interesting because it's almost like the curse has power over Finduilas as well. Yeah, and it's uh, as as we move on, and uh, the, you know, he he ends up leading battles against the orcs and Glaurung coming down into. I guess I could bring up the map here if we need to. Um, 
Well, also, we need to talk about the fact that name number three or four of the get he, he gets he, he gets his third name or his fourth name of this chapter. So, uh, Warmigil? yep. Yeah, Jonathan's favorite name apparently. That is my favorite name. In fact, okay, so I will say I on Twitter today I did put up um, a uh, a poll to see what people's favorite name was, and right now I, I put up four because Twitter only limits you to four. So I put up Nathan the Wronged, the Mormigil, Black Sword, the Wild Man of the Woods, or Gorthol the Dread Helm, and uh, the Mormigil is winning at forty five point two percent. So I'm not alone in my love of the Mormigil. <laughs> Anyway, but yeah, uh, go on, Michael. Sorry, I interrupted. Well, it's almost like there's, there, Tolkien is laying out all the ways of things that could go wrong in love. So he, it isn't just a, the opposite of a Baron and Luthien story where there's this tremendous love that overcomes even death. Here we have two loves, both of which go terribly wrong. Um, so anyway, the, to make a long story short about the first part, you have... Uh, more McGill, and he actually doesn't let anyone know that he's Turin. So he, so he want he asks Gwyndor. He he doesn't name himself as Turin, and they just know him as the More McGill. And so, and maybe there was another name. There was Agarwain, son of Umarth. Hmm. There we go. Um, Umarth means. Wait, let me find it. The bloodstained. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, bloodstained son of ill fate. Umarth means ill fate. Such another positive name, the bloodstained son of ill fate. And when people are like, "Hey, that's a who named their child the bloodstained?" <laughs> My goodness, who's your mom? That's the sort of thing that, like, uh, you know, nobody talks about. And his sword gets a new name, Gurthang, Iron of Death. Gurthang. So, so anyway, he's he becomes a warrior, and he essentially convinces all the people of Nargothorn to stop doing guerrilla warfare and shift to actual warfare against Morgoth, which is a bad idea. Right. As it turns out. So they build a permanent bridge across the river. And we'll notice from our map that Nargothrond is on the other side of the river Ringwell. And so, or Narog. And so um, they are able to um, keep themselves safe up to this point. But now they have a permanent bridge. And it turns out the enemy takes advantage of it. To make a long story short, the, the enemy, although not too long of a story. This part of the story is only about three pages. The armies of Morgoth come, and at the head of them is Glaurung, and they um, give battle to the uh, to the army of Morgoth, and they are they are they are beaten badly, and uh, Oradreth is slain, so the king of Nargothorn is slain, and um, Gwyndor is wounded. To Gwyndor is, is mortally wounded, and uh, with no Monty Python escape from this <laughs> yes. so he in fact dies and then um, Turin rushes back to Nargothrond which is being sacked and all of the women and um, helpless are being led away to be slaves and, and and we get Gwyndor's foreshadowing of where he says to him about uh, Fendulas she alone stands between thee and thy doom if thou fail her it shall not fail to find thee so uh, he even knew that something with Findulas was going on. I just like that we get that uh, that foreshadowing that like, hey, 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 you, you better love her and not whoever's coming in the future because that could pose problems for you. That's right. That's right. So, but he fails. So he goes, he goes back over the bridge and um, faces Glaurung and, with his sword. And then, as Dan mentioned, he is ensorcelled, spelled by the dragon. And the dragon holds him captive with his eyes while everyone else is let off. And Finduelas walks, I believe, right. She sees him. Doesn't she call out to him as well? Yes. She cried out to Turin as she went, but not until her cries and the wailings of the captives was lost upon the northward road mm -hmm. did Glaurung release Turin. And he might not stop his ears against that voice that haunted him after. Yeah, it's... Um... It's it, there's so much more detail to this here in both I think unfinished tales in Narn Ihin Hurin and in the uh, Children of Hurin book. Right. So reading this feels a little bit like getting the Cliff's Notes. I'd highly recommend you go in and read that end because there's a much longer conversations that go on between all of this, uh, between Glaurung and Turin and Neonor and uh, and well and fin Finduilas. Um, so so at this point he flees. 
he leaves he until well guang leaves he releases him uh and then he hastens to the north uh takes him what 40 leagues i think i i remember the, it reading and he was 40 leagues get, and more yes 40 leagues and more yeah and so he was trying to get back to door loman i believe in order to see what's up with mormon and, and neonor yep uh, the dragon had taunted him with that so he goes off yeah. running off after the carrot and uh, turns out the carrot is long gone <laughs> and he he gets there and then he's like no nope, no i mean you, you got your we're gonna slay you broda the easterling that was there uh and there's a whole lot more to this character broda in the, the children of Hurin, so i, I like can't go into that i think i want to go into some of that and i want to reread that but that's for like you said in another two years when we read through that book well we are all we are all two-thirds of the way through this one so we'll we're be uh, we'll have to read something else after that yeah so. yeah uh, might as well return to uh, literary self-flagellation and read more about <laughs> <laughs> that's I can read more of my favorite story um so uh so at this point right uh he he, he does learn though that uh let's see so he finds the the men of brethel at this point and the men of brethel right or men of halleth brethel halleth people in brow people of halleth who live in brethel correct um and uh they're led by well, by the uh, way we, we can't pass up the fact that he ruined everything for the rem the remaining people right. in back in door loman because he kills broda and then and then the easterlings and, rise up and basically right. causes the destruction of the remnants of his people back in that right. land so then he goes to brethel in the woods of brethel go ahead jonathan and, yeah and uh they're led by a, a girly man named brandier <laughs> i think a gentle was the word a man of gentle mood or, well, he uh, was lame too. He was lame, yeah. Meaning he had a club <laughs> foot, is what I believe it was put in. Super uh, lame. So, meaning he, he was, didn't have a TikTok account. Dude, he was lame and gentle. What's up with that, man? Uh, yeah, he was. He was lame, and he 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 was not a fighter. Uh, and it's with them that he learns that Findwilas was speared to a tree, and she said, "I believe, tell the Mormagil that I am Findulas is here." Or Findulas, uh, I'm trying to remember that exact line. I don't have it highlighted, but yeah. Uh, and they they raise up Howth and Eleth, a mound upon there, and he goes there, and then he he's distraught again. Uh, let me see. He lays back and wielded the bow and the spear. He, he yeah. So he, he 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 decides almost like not to fight at this point. Right, so he's right? he's he's trying to retire. Yeah, he's trying to retire. But <laughs> meanwhile, back in Doriath, yeah. his his mother and his sister have, uh, or his mother specifically, has grown impatient with not, and she she hears um, about the story of Nargothrond, and she has takes it in her mind that she is going to set out and find her son, and her daughter um, cleverly and sadly decides to go along with her. She hides. Um, and this is where Glauron comes in again, because uh, as they're searching, they go to Nagothrond. Uh, essentially, without going into all the details, uh, uh, Mormon tells tells uh, Neonor to leave. She doesn't leave. There's uh, Neonor uh, is her sis, his sister. His sister, right? Uh, there, uh, because of Glauron, there's a great steam that goes up, and she's on like a, 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 a I guess a hill, a mound, or something like that. And then near her is Glauron. She looks up, past the steam into his eyes at this point, and then she falls under the spell of Glaurong. And this is where things go really, really wrong. Th that scene was, the beginning of that scene was almost exactly like an Arthurian tale. Mm. The sentence was, but Neonor being thrown by her steed, yet unhurt, made her way back to Amon Ethir, that's the hill, there to await oh. Mablung, who had, who had come as their guard, as, and, and came thus above the reek into the sunlight, and looking westward, she stared straight into the eyes of Glaurung, whose head lay upon the hilltop. Yeah. So it's this, I mean, it gives you this vision of like a, a dragon who's so large that it's just his head on the hilltop. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's, she looks right in his eyes, and then she is inspelled as well. And she forgets everything about her own history. So she becomes, she even forgets how to speak. Um, so he basically casts a spell upon her um, of forgetfulness, and she runs off in a weird and ironic moment, runs off naked into the woods uh, like a wild deer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Swifter than a deer. Uh, this is after the orc gave chase. She, she was awoken essentially by cries of orcs. 
uh, after she had she was she had fallen into that stupor. She, and that's she, weird because this whole story of Turin began with a taunt from an elf. Well, from Seros. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Who said, uh, "Do do your women run like wild deer in the woods, naked, except for the hair, or something along those lines?" Right. And uh, and yeah, that that was definitely like that. That's not an accident that Tolkien wrote it that way. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there's another mention of a deer later. I'm not. I feel like well, even then, right? Is that because it talks about uh, being a, po a, point, a point where the deer le leapt over something, and that's where essentially, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is essentially where um, Minor leapt as well. Um, so I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into that. Right. Well, she is found by Turin, she who does not Turin. know her because, of course, he's never seen her since she was a child. Um, so he doesn't know her, and he and she doesn't know herself, and so he gives her a new name, Niniel, Tear Maiden. And uh, and time she, passes, and he falls she come, in love she, with her. Mm -hmm. She she goes back to live with him in the woods of Brethel, with the people of Brethel, and the gentle Brondir um, falls in love with her, and but also Turin falls in love with her, her being his own sister. So. So, so even Brandir has, he, Tolkien writes, for, for Brandir foreboded he knew not what after Turin asked for her hand in marriage, after Turin asked for Niniel in marriage. And there's all this, everybody has this sense of foreboding around Turin. And so let, let me kind of ask sort of a deeper question about, about that and doom and foreshadowing, foreboding and um, the dangers surrounding a doom spoken upon a person. Like how much of this is Turin's doing and how much of this is Morgoth's doing? How much can, can we say, that, is, it, is it a self-fulfilling prophecy that Turin has created for himself? I mean, obviously Glaurung has a big part of it, but if Turin would have made some dumb mistakes in there, right, he wouldn't have had it. So how much of this and this foreboding is this, where is this all coming from, I guess, is maybe a good way. Just, just a point of conversation, like how much do we ap apply to Turin and how much do we apply to, to Morgoth? I... Free I would, will versus... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I actually, I actually think it's it's like a seventy thirty. I think it's seventy Morgoth, thirty Turin. I don't. Mm -hmm. I think he's a tragic character with some flaws, but he's also uh, could have been a hero. But we are, and, and I, when I say Morgoth, I mean through the a instrument of Glaurung. So Glaurung is a is is an actor with his own power and will, and exerts that. Um, and so, so, but he's ultimately just an instrument of Morgoth. Mm -hmm. um, but there are plenty of other things before Glauron ever shows up. Yeah. I mean, horrible well, things that happen yeah. that happened to Turin. And is it Turin's fault? Let's let's go back to the first moment. Okay. The first and first terrible moment, truly terrible one. And that is that Turin slays his own friend, Bellic. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first truly terrible one. Before that there were some bad moments, but not terrible ones. Yeah. And so um well he, well the 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 betrayal of his men by meme that's not his fault um but when turin is has been tortured is unconscious is wakes up after being cut and lashes out because he thinks he's still captured by orcs and doesn't know any better is that really his fault is it would you say oh that's a deep flaw he shouldn't have done that i i, I can't i, I yeah, can't see no, that no. i can't see that either necessarily although you could say he had advice and he uh, from from Melian, and he cast aside that advice to take the sword that it would essentially be the one. I mean, you could say like maybe he would have been set free if they didn't have uh, the you know Anglachel. But uh, I, I yeah, I, I mean to me that's a little more. Uh, I, I lean towards more fifty fifty than seventy thirty. But it's a um, it's a wishy washy fifty fifty. I'm I'm willing to be persuaded otherwise. Hmm. Just because he he right he he speaks evil on himself all the time. Right. He mm -hmm. he says I am cursed. I am always, you know, I, I'm uh, the like. Do not, do, do, oh, what, what, let me let me get that line yeah, exactly he's, right. Yeah, he's speaking. I, while you're finding it, you're right. He's speaking evil on himself even before anything really bad has happened. He calls himself Nathan the Wronged. Right, right. Like, and, when he hasn't even been wronged, actually. Right, right. Except right. for insulted. A, his character, cares. his character, accepts all the evil that has been cast at him. He's like, "Yep, you're right. I'm I'm a bad guy." Right. That, that, in, in general, that's sort of the the simplest way to put it. And so he mm -hmm. never. He never tries to rise above that. And so because of that, he's easily corrupted by Morgoth. He's easily told that, you know, what, what is it? He's, uh, uh, I, I got to say my favorite one. He's Captain Foolhardy, 
You know, I can big <laughs> F on his chest. He's like, Captain, he doesn't, he's like, <laughs> sorry, Captain he, embr- he, embra- he embraces it. Yes, right. He, go, he right. goes like, oh, all these terrible things about me. Yep, that's me. I'll yeah. take it. And it, it's such a bizarre, it's such a well, bizarre, uh, it's almost like a pride about it. Like, I, I just don't care to, to be any different. I don't know. Well, it's almost like he's in a continual act of a kind of despair. Mm-hmm. Like he despairs and despairs and despairs. And it's and there are there is a temperament that's like this where you know I've I, I have a good friend from my childhood who has this this struggle where when bad things happen he almost revels in it it's it's mm-hmm. almost like he loves the tragedy and he loves wallowing in misery and so that's the or he can in his dark moments love wallowing in misery and so and so there's a there's a real um, I, I see. I, I think you're right, Dan. I think Turin has that that kind of character. Yeah. So the question then is percentage wise. Well, not everything is, is a percentage a in no, life. I but... know, I know, but it's an it's a it's a it's a great way of uh, creating a title and podcast app for this. <laughs> so, do you have like Dan? What do you think? What do you think? Like, if you had to like like pin Morgoth Morgoth's influence versus Turin's. Influence. And are we counting? Um, we're, are we counting Glaurung in with Morgoth? Yeah, I would influence? say, yeah, for sure. Glaurung, yeah. Morgoth, the same character, the same <sighs> influence. Same. Influence. Yeah, it's 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 kind of odd to me because I don't really understand the dynamic, at least as far as Tolkien is concerned, with what what does Morgoth actually do? Like he he pronounces a curse on on the mm-hmm. children of Hurin, but like how does he put that into effect? I don't really quite understand the metaphysics of that. Um, in terms of like, he's a Valar, he has power, but what does he do exactly to make all these things go bad? I don't, I and don't That's really one thing, <clears throat> one thing that I would have loved to reference back a, a recent podcast with Austin Freeman. I would have loved to have talked to him about, because I don't think he goes into it in his book, but in Christian metaphysics and Jewish metaphysics, there are curses do have power. Um, blessings and curses have power and they don't have they 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 can have power from the person that does it like when god blesses or curses they can have power from um close bloodline like parents for example and they have a power in themselves it isn't just blessings and curses do and it's not just you know a way of saying i hope something bad happens to you or i hope something good happens to you there's actually a a power and morgoth we know he spends himself. He, he he is always spending his power and in putting it into things, in creating evil from it. Um, mm. And so it's so I see it as a I see it as a, a largely his curse actually. Um, so he's although I do I don't I don't want to take away Turin's um, own despair and yeah. his own flaws. And, and and you could almost say that Turin is cursing himself by what he does. I think he does. I think yeah. he plays along with the curse. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. Know. It's like, it's, it seems like a rational, the way Turin reacts is kind of rational. It's, it's, it's from his perspective, it's like things just go bad and mm-hmm. he's never seen things go good. It's like, it's always bad. Everything he tries to do, it just falls apart. So hmm. I don't, I don't see how he could react any other way. I mean, he oh, you don't have any, he doesn't have any hope that like, like whatever, whatever, if he goes left or right, it's going to go bad. It seems like. So that's interesting because I could see that at a certain point, Dan, but in yeah. the beginning of his story, I can't see that. So he yeah. goes and o- overreacts to an insult and gets a guy killed and then that's runs true. off to the woods, j- becomes the head of an outlaw band, calls himself the wronged, which yeah, is he ridiculous. Did, yeah. And then, <laughs> and then when he's forgiven and given pardon, he refuses it. That's so, true. so you, in the first part of the story, I think it's all his flaws influenced maybe a little bit by the curse but then as the story goes on he gets deeper and deeper he kills his best friend that seems like the turning point yeah i think it's really hard to come back and then the the one you know to get back to the story the one light shining light the the joy that is brought to him is nino right and so they love each other. They clearly have an affection for each other, right? If if they weren't brother and sister, mm-hmm. it would be perfectly fine. Um, but uh, even, like I said, even uh, Brandier has a foreboding about their relationship. Not, and it's, yes. I mean, maybe it's just because Brandier loved Niniel as well. Uh, but uh, you know th- that was his joy, and we like it's it's rough it, to me. It was so rough reading that whole section because you just know it's coming, and you're like, 
Oh, mm -hmm. especially when you get into the extended versions of the children of Hurin and Narni and Hurin in, uh, in the Unfinished Tales. But uh, it, it, it's, it's rough. It's rough. And, and, but it makes it, and to me, it makes it so interesting because like the first time I read it, I was like, what is going to happen here? How is this going to be resolved? Uh, and it's well, I mean, it's resolved tragically. So, so I mean, just Tolkien. I don't think leaning there's any in, other way. It, it's either that, or that it's gonna it's gonna be like storm. a yeah yeah. It's either, it's either resolved in a horrible way, or they get some sort of um, you know TV show, some sort of uh, <laughs> real, real life real yeah <laughs> right right. So maybe we should quickly outline what actually happens in the rest of the story here. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to take that on or? Uh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead and fill in where I where I yeah. mess up. Okay. But essentially, um, Turin and Niniel, um, who is his, actually his sister, um, they fall in love. Um, there are some will we, won't we get married, and then they do. It takes them a few years, so they're really mm -hmm. in a relationship for many years, like three, four, five years before yep. even getting married. And then um, they find out. Uh, so so. Uh, the Morgoth's forces once again come up, this time against the men of Brethel. Um, Turin has sworn that he won't take up arms unless the woods themselves are attacked, but he's mocked when the men are crushed by the forces of Morgoth. So he takes up the challenge and brings battle to the forces of Morgoth, wins a victory or two, and then decides to go to Nargothrond and hunt down Glaurung. Glaurung. And oh. so he does. He hunts him down. He comes up with a cunning plan. There's a red shirt that goes along with him. <laughs> Dorless? Um, Wait, not Dorless. Hun Hunthor. Uh, Hunthor. 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 Yeah. It's a great name. Hunthor the red shirt. And we, <laughs> we, we see him. We're, we're told what a hero he is at one point even. But you know, basically all he does is go along with Okay. Him. Let me ask. The, the, the words that he uses is, is, is uh, and maybe you have more knowledge about this, is not the least valiant of the men of Brethel. I'm like, wait. Not the least valiant. That's like my, my least favorite announcer in, in football that says he's as good as any running back. I'm like, that doesn't say anything about how good he is if he's as good as any running back. That means he's as bad as any running back, too. So he's, as, he's not the least valiant. Well, that's good. You're better than the worst guy. You're second worst. You could be second worst, and he's not the least valiant. So I don't know. Is there, is there a history to that phrase that I'm missing? Because I hate that phrase so much. Um, <laughs> so he ended of the house of Hel Heleth, not the least valiant. So, yeah, <laughs> you're right. It does seem to be sort of uh, damning with faint praise, as the, saying, as, yeah. as the saying goes. Uh, but but I think um, not the least valiant is just a way of saying that he had the cur he had courage. Mm -hmm. So so it is an old way of speaking. Yeah. And what you're saying is he didn't fall below the, the level of the virtue of courage. So he had courage. Mm. So he was a courageous. I like the way you put that. Um, he was a courageous member of the That's house of hell. Certainly more courageous than Brandier, although Brandier did have a club foot, but Brandier refused to go. Uh, and, and ultimately, and here's the thing, I, I don't think it's damning with faint praise because in the few sentences before, their third companion, Dorlos, but the heart of Dorlos failed when they came to the races right. of Taglin yeah, in the right. dark, that's and he right. dared not attempt the perilous crossing, but drew back and lurked in the woods, burdened with shame. So, so, so Hunthor is, a, is more valiant than he is. That's true. Um, that's and, true. And, and, and I guess Brandier is more valiant than, than Dorlos because he later slays Dorlos. He finds him and right. just kills him because he, he abandoned uh, Turin. And right. Hunthor. So Hunthor doesn't abandon Turin, but dies anyway. And he dies in this plot that Turin has to come up on the underside of um, Glaurung. So Glaurung such a huge worm that he has laid his body across the chasm between from over the river. And um, so, so Turin, in a very Indiana Jones-like moment, is going to uh, come up from the underside and, and uh, slay Glaurung from... Where, where he's weak. I mean, also it's a throw back, throw forward, whatever, to to Smaug and the death of Smaug. You know, the underbelly of the worm is is, is supposed to be the softest. The underbelly yeah. of a dragon is supposed to be their weak point. And let's remember, he has no wings. Yes, wingless dragon. No, wingless dragon. Good point. Good good reminder. Yes. So then, so he finally, so he comes up and he um, kind of see it right there. And he and he draws Gurthang, his uh, sword, and stabs um stabs glaurung mortally and then what follows is almost a parody scene where you know how we in movies sometimes you have these these last uh, monologues before someone the hero or the villain dies 
and they just keep going on and on and on and they're not dead yet and they're not dead yet and they're not so glaurung is supposed to have this mortal wound and he's you know in fact he's belching fire and thrashing around and let, lighting the woods on fire and then he lies still um now, Gurthang had been wrested from Turambar's hand in the throw of Glaurung and a clave to the belly of the dragon. Only time I remember you seeing the word clave, which is awesome. <laughs> Turambar therefore crossed the water once more, desiring to recover his sword and look upon his foe. And he found him stretched at his length and rolled upon one side, and the hilt of Glau, the hilts, oh, plural, interesting, of Gurthang stood in his belly. Then Turambar seized the hilt and set his foot upon the belly and cried in mockery of the dragon and his words at Nargothrond, Hail, worm of Morgoth, well met again. Die now, and dark the darkness have thee. Thus is Turin, son of Hurin, avenged. So he pulls the sword out, but big gout of venom comes with it and burns him. And then Glaurung opens his eyes and looks upon Turin with such malice that it smote him as a blow. And then he, he basically goes unconscious by being looked at the dragon. Um, yeah. So, and, and and this is when the cries of Glaurung that rang in the woods, right? It, it, Niniel is drawn now to where Turin is, right? And so she runs to him. Brandir follows slowly behind her, um, uh, or he tries to take her, and she's like, "Wait, where are you going?" And he, he's like, "No, this way. The only way to go is to retreat, is to get into the woods, is to hide." Mm -hmm. She's like, "No, but Turin is my love, and I I, I will only go toward him." Black sword was my beloved and my husband to seek him. Only do I go. What else could you think? And so, so she got way in front of him because he couldn't keep up. And this is when she comes upon Turin. She thinks Turin is lying dead. She called his name in vain and the finding his hand was burned. She washed it with tears and bound it with a strip of her raiment and kissed in him and cried on him to again to wake. And Glaurung stirred and he said, Hail Nino, daughter of Hurin. We meet again ere the end. I give thee joy that thou hast found thy brother at last. And now thou shalt know him a stabber in the dark, treacherous to foes, faithless to friends, and a curse unto his kin. Turin, son of Hurin, but the worst of all his deeds thou shalt feel in thyself. Like, oh, brutal. Like, what a way yep. to go. So he lifts the, the, the spell from her eyes so she knows now that she is indeed Turin's sister and um, she is carrying his child. And so she um, despairs utterly. And, um, but she ran from him distraught with horror and anguish and coming to the brink of Kabat and Aras, she cast herself over and was lost in the wild water. So she commits suicide. Um, Turin, by, by the way, is still unconscious lying next to the dragon. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, Brandir finds the, sees her jump off thinks Turin is dead, goes back, tells everyone Turin is dead, Nino is dead, and Turin is dead is good tidings. But he's not really dead. I'm not dead yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he awakes. Um, and, and I guess if we jump forward just a, a little bit more, we it's that, um, oh, let's see. Uh, no, no, no. He awakes. He doesn't, sorry, he doesn't meet Mablong yet. But he awakes. He sees his hand was cleansed. His hand was like uh, like bound uh, the one that was uh, uh, hurt by the venom, by the blood, after he pulled the hilts out. And he gets back, he goes back to the men of Brethel, to Brandir. And Brandir tells him what happens. And Turambar decides to just say, no, that's not true, and slays him. Mm -hmm. uh, he fell into a fury, for in those words, meaning um, uh, those words that Brandir spoke about what Glaurung had said, that he was Turin, that, that she was Ninior, Nienor. Uh, I love this here, this line. Turinbar fell into a fury, for in those words he heard the feet of his doom overtaking him. Oh, I, I don't know. I love that line. Just, it just it's so visual, but it's 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 scary. It's a little nightmarish. Mm. Um, and you know, you know where the parallel is to, to that is the dwarves sing this song about the fall of Erebor, the Lonely Mountain, in The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. And part in one of the verses of the song, it says, the dwarves, they heard the tramp of doom. And this mm. is the, com the coming of Smaug that is going to destroy and be end their, end their, um, their, whole, their whole kingdom, essentially. And so this, uh, the, the tramp of doom is something that, that, yeah. is, that occurs more than once, as we know Tolkien likes to do yeah. literary echoes. That's in the Misty Mountains... Right. Uh, song that they sing with uh, Bilbo at Bag End. 
Correct. Hmm. I had that. Wow, that's that's a deep cut there. I did. I, how did? Wow. The mountains so smoked the, beneath the moon. The dwarves they heard the tramp of doom. They fled their hall to dying fall beneath his feet beneath the moon. The the feet of Smaug. So yeah, and interesting that almost you know we got a dragon with the tramp of doom and now a dragon with the 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 feet of his doom overtaking him. Right. Well, yeah, this dragon led to his doom in a slightly. He didn't stomp him to doom, but he. Uh, <laughs> But he led to, let gave him a doom as yes. even worse, arguably, than uh, just being crushed. So, so um, Turin himself then despairs. Well, he hears the truth from Magblung. So the elf Magblung comes back, tells him the truth, and then he Doran, uh, Turin rather flees, and um, he flees back to where Neonor threw herself over the edge at Cabin mm-hmm. in Paris. And then he, 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 we have the talking sword moment. <laughs> what did you guys think about this? I, the first time I read it, I'm like, wait, what? what the, <laughs> is, it, you, is, that, is that a sword talking? Like, okay, it's one thing to have like the, the, the hound who on talk. That's, that's mm-hmm. fine. I can go with it. The sword? What? Is, there, is there any other place that this in, in Tolkien's world, or does this come from anything in particular uh, that he's inspired by that, that we know? I don't know enough about all the details in this, but it just struck me as such an odd thing. To have a talking sword. I don't know if there's any way to go yeah. with that. Yeah, it strikes me as weird. It's weird. It's, it's too fantastical. <laughs> like, 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 I love Middle Earth because it seems like the, we've talked about this before, but it seems like the magic that there is is kind of rooted in the world. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not like a, it's not like Harry Potter where you're just zooming around and you're, yeah casting spells and there's just magical things all over the place it's like no it's just the world itself is is fantastical i don't know yeah maybe that, and, doesn't, maybe that doesn't make sense well but. and we have to go into like so what is this life that it has or is it is it is it tour and casting this voice in his head right is it a nightmare of what the, what what it would say will thou take me swiftly and he imagines it saying like though he doesn't say it i guess you know that's the way that you could read that well but but well here's here, here's what's interesting if we read the passage and from the blade rang a cold voice in answer. Yea, I will drink thy blood gladly, so that so I may forget the blood of Belig, my master, and the blood of Brandir slain unjustly. I will slay thee swiftly. So a one way of reading it is that this is a projection of Morgoth, basically, and part of the curse. The voice of the sword here in bringing up Turin's sins with regard to Belig and Brandir, sounds suspiciously like the voice of Glaurung did, telling him hmm. all, casting all the stories of his life in the worst possible it's, light. It's like the final moment of his doom over right. him. So, so I can read this not as the sword talking, but as the final effect of the spell of Glaurung um, on on his mind that the sword answers him um, and blames him. You know, it doesn't just say, yeah, I will slay you swiftly. He's like, yeah, I will slay you swiftly. Because in case you had forgotten, you killed my master Belig with me and you killed Brandier unjustly. Yeah. And so the this is so in a way, this feels almost like a projection of the curse along with the psychological torment inside of Turin's head. So I might be wrong yeah. about that, but I well I, the the only thing I don't quite get is earlier in the story when he kills Belig, and I think it's uh is it Gwyndor who's looking at the blade and he says, this is strange. Unlike any I've seen in middle earth, it mourns for Beleg. So it's like even some other third party is like, Hey, this sword is weird. It's sad. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Right. Right. I don't quite understand. Yeah. Yeah, Fair point. They're, they're obviously, well, okay. But Tolkien doesn't, isn't against giving inanimate objects agency. So the ring has some kind of agency. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Even though it's it's a ring, um, it has part of Sauron in it. But you could say that, uh, in fact, it, we were even told that the sword, the black sword, has the spirit of Ale in it. In the in the fir- when we were first introduced right. to it, yeah, Unglock Hill. I think um, maybe maybe the way to look at it for me, like I'm just thinking about this now, is even going back all the way to the Silmarils, where it talks about the fire within them, and there was a little bit of anthropomorphism into the the, Sil- the Silmarils even then when Fëanor right. first created them. It. Whatever is created by somebody with such power 
it's imbued into that object. And sometimes that's, that's done, that's released as like, you know, as, as something that, that consumes everything like the, the, the fire of Feanor into the fire of the Silmarils and with the fire of the, the trees and all that sort of stuff. And sometimes right. it's the, the evil of ale and the demanding nature of his, um, uh, 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 like he wants to own people and things. And so even here we see that like, yeah, yeah I will gladly drink thy blood. Right. Uh, and it, it has the nature of the creator who made it within it. Or maybe it's just an alien sword because it was uh, made from a meteorite. And so it comes from, you know, the planet Kuzlfoss. I don't know. <laughs> but no, I think, I think the whole thing that, the power, that it's infused with the power of the person that created it and whether for good or evil, like the rings, the good elven rings that were forged by the elves, right? They were infused with the power of the elves and they did their part in preserving the elven kingdoms because of the power of the people that created it. Right. You could probably say the same thing here. Right. Well, you know, I'm reminded, it's interesting what you said about magic, Dan, because I, I feel the same way about Tolkien versus um, the Harry Potter treatment or even C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicles yeah. treatment of magic there um, or others, uh, other treatments of magic. One of the things about Tolkien's world is it's um, it's technically classified as low fantasy in a certain regard um, amongst uh, a lot of pe- for a lot of people that when they come up with sub genres of, of liter- literary sub genres, because it doesn't it, it isn't people just like walking around casting spells, throwing fireballs. It isn't like a D and D movie or something like that. Um, But I'm reminded because I just, I'm reading, reading the Lord of the Rings, my sons um, and my youngest daughter right now. And we just read the the chapter where after the voice of Saruman, where Pippin looks into the Palantir and, and uh, Sauron sees him through the Palantir Mm -hmm. and Sauron incorrectly thinks that he's a prisoner of Saruman because Sauron doesn't know that Saruman has been defeated. Um, And then there's all these references where Gandalf is talking about the Palantir and they've basically come to the conclusion. This is a Palantir and there's all these. So, so you have these characters, you have, Gandalf, who's come back from the dead, this wizard sitting there talking about this incident where a hobbit just spoke over hundreds of miles to, um, uh, you know, Sauron through a glass orb. And you have, and then Gandalf talks about how he himself might be tempted to use, he's glad he gave it to Aragorn when he and Pippin take off for Minas Tirith, because he himself might be tempted to use it. And then he, and he, and he has this line, which I had forgotten, which is really cool. And he says he, he would have desired to look back at Eldamar and see the light of the two trees. Cause you can look in time through the Palantir, right. not, not just over space, the Palantir. And so when I think about that, I think, is that really low magic? What we have here, like Tolkien treats of it in such a realistic way that it doesn't feel chintzy the way Harry Potter magic feels chintzy. Right. Or or even sometimes Narnia magic feels ex like it's just deus ex machina magic where it just sort of it's oh, it there happens. for the purpose of because a plot point needs to be fulfilled. So we have a, a yeah. magic happens. And so but Tolkien's magic feels differently. But is it really um is it really low? I mean, if you, if I start thinking about all the things that had just happened with the with the Battle of Wills and the voice of Saruman and his effect in magic and the Ents ripping apart Isengard and all the and the magic of the Orthanc itself, which the Ents can't even touch because it's made of this black stone. I think mean, everything about this whole scenario that I'm just re- in the middle of reading is full of the magical, the mysterious, the 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 beyond natural. And um, and so Tolkien is full of it, full of all that, but he does it in a way which immerses you and doesn't make it feel fake. And that's I, I think that's where his yeah. and 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 this story, I think we're the, this talking sword is jarring, just like Baron and Luthien was jarring yeah. to us in certain instances, yeah. because he's writing this sort of perfunctory skeleton of a story, and he just throws in these moments, which if he had actually devoted enough time, my my opinion if he had devoted enough time to turn them into stories, the way the Lord of the Rings had been a story, yeah. he would have, they would have got the full Lord of the Rings treatment and they wouldn't mm-hmm. feel this way. That's, that's, uh, that's what I think. And, yeah, and I think, right. I think reading through it where we learn about the creation of the world, it sets us, sets us up to be like, this is how everything is. And so we mm. almost expect it to be like explained to us because everything has been like where people come from, who the bad guys are, how the angels appeared, right? How the world was created, like all those sorts of things, how, how men woke up on the lakes of, uh, on the shores of Lake Quivienne and how Finrod found them, right? We find out everything, but, but the, the nature of magic is never explained. And even, you know, Tolkien hesitates at times to call it magic. Um, uh, so, and, and I think we just have to kind of be okay with it and say like, this is, 
like, uh, man, is this from a, is this from a letter? Where, whereas, you know, art taken to a very high degree looks like magic to the hobbits, right? Mm. When you, because elves are the height of, of, of artistry, um, whether by crafting or by gardening even. Uh, and it looks like magic to them, but to the elves, it's just what it is. And so when you take something to the height of artistry, you end up with things like, um, like the Silmarils, like uh, Anglachel, um, like those things right. that are viewed with power. And, and I would take what you're seeing one step further, Jonathan. I would mm -hmm. say, actually, to the hobbits and to mere men, this is magic. Yes. But to elves and to the Maiar, it's just an extension of their art and right. their nature. It's right. not a. It's not like a mysterious manipulation of the forces of the universe. It's just part of who right. they are. They put their will into things, and the things are formed by their will because yeah. of their place in nature, yes. and and so so whether for e evil or or for good, and so so I do think I think both things can be true at once. I think you can mm -hmm. have magic and you can have art, and it depends on the perspective it's coming from, and I think some of Tolkien's treatment of magical things in the Silmarillion is perfunctory and comes off as jarring. And I think yeah. this is one, this is one of them. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And this is also the end of it is Turin Turinbar. So he yeah. kills himself. He's, he stabs himself with his own sword and uh, dies. All right. So now that I've read this, Jonathan, this is one of your favorite stories. <laughs> I have to say, I don't like Turin Turinbar because for <laughs> me, for me, it's like what I like about Tolkien generally is that there is evil, but then there always seems to be like a glimmer of hope. There's, there seems to be like a through line of Eru Iluvatar is working things out for good. We just don't necessarily always see it, but it's, 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 like, it's like Sam looking up in Mordor. He looks mm -hmm. up and he sees the star and he mm -hmm. remembers mm -hmm. there is hope. There is mm -hmm. light and high beauty beyond this murkiness that I'm around, that I, this darkness that I'm sitting in. And for Turin Turinbar, there is not anything like that. It's it's just his whole life is chaos. To, to be like a Jordan Peterson, you know, psychologist, it's it's there's no order. It's all chaos. He's going through life, and he's kind of just he kind of just does whatever his hand finds to do, and it's it's it doesn't work out well at, at any point. <laughs> so maybe maybe you can bounce off of that, but like that, that's just kind of how it strikes me. Is like this is just. Uh, it, it hits me as like, it's all tragedy. It's all bad. And then it's over. I don't know. What do you think about that? Um, well, I don't think that I have to like a character to like the sure. story. I mean, sure. that's, that's kind of, I'm reading, um, here, I have this book right here. Oh, I almost dropped it. I'm reading, uh, Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy too. I don't know if you guys have ever read much of Cormac yeah. McCarthy. He's not exactly the, uh, chipper, mm. happy go lucky writer either. Nope. <laughs> so, I mean, he's, yeah. his most famous work is the road for, for the people. road. And then he also did uh, no country for old men, which was the movie. Yeah. Uh, oh, I guess that that's probably the most famous yeah, now, but the road, the, ro the road yeah. is probably his most famous book. Um, and, uh, but, but I enjoy it because it's written really well sure. and I enjoy the characters, even though there's no hope. And, I, um, you're right. I think part of, part of the, the joy of Tolkien that you find in the Lord of the Rings is that, uh, even in the darkest of places, there is hope. And here we have the darkest of places and the darkness simply remains, except for Glaurung. Glaurung is dead. The big worm, the, the, the one that threatens so much is dead. Although now we have the next chapter, of course, is called Of the Ruin of Doriath, which is now right. <laughs> a major problem that happens because of what Turin did too. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just appreciate, like, here's the thing. Tolkien didn't write many stories from the beginning to the end in his, like, as a, uh, a self-contained tale about a particular uh, through line, like mm -hmm. The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and then really of Tour and Tour Bar. I, am I missing one? I don't, I don't think so. Like, I, and I don't mean like Farmer Giles of Ham or um, any of, you know, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, those little things. I mean like a larger story. And if you go into The Children of Hurin, uh, Dan, if you read that through, there's so much more about like the, the character, the, the, the guy with the lame foot who was his, uh, like his servant helper guy, Labadal, I believe was his name in the children's room. Like there's all these characters and it's a full story. And because Tolkien didn't write much more, I think I appreciate that much more because that's mm -hmm. all we have. Um, but no, I mean, I don't, I don't like Turin either. Like he's a, he's a horrible character. And I mean, what's kind of cool is that at the end of this in, uh, Unfinished Tales in the Narni Hin Hurin, it's called, and also in the Children of Hurin, you actually get back to what happens with, uh, Morwin, his mother and Hurin comes back too, actually. 
Uh, and there's just a very brief bit about that, which is, which, uh, well, like, I, I like that at least it's tied up, even though it's tied up in a sad way there too. It's not exactly super happy. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. I, that, 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 that's my thing is I, I appreciate it for the quality that it is for the characters that are created and for how he wove all these characters we learned about in the Silmarillion into this one story. I mean, you've got Thingol and Melian and Hurin and uh, Turin and Mablung and uh, uh, Beleg uh, and uh, Gwyndor and Orodreth. Right? All these characters that we've already met are now woven into this one story that surround like what happens with, with, uh, with Turin. And I, it's done so well, and I, and I love some of the prose in it that I, I can't help but like it. Sure. More the second time through, third time through, fourth time through. So I'm with you, Dan. I think um, this this story has none of the hope that Tolkien's f full wrought stories have. One of the things I would point out, we skipped this. Hmm. There's a passage in this last part of Turin Turin Bar, um, and it says, uh, now it came to pass when 495 years had passed since the rising of the moon. In the spring of the year, there came to Nargothrond two elves named Gelmir and Arminus. Um, so maybe the first Arminian. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Ouch. All wow. right. They, they were of Angrod's people. But since the Dagor Bragalach, they dwelt in the south with Kyrd and the Shipwright. So these elves bring news, and it's a it's it's in an, over in one sentence, but it's kind of interesting because they say there's these armies of Morgoth gathering, so beware. And they told also that Ulmo had come to Círdan, giving warning that great peril drew nigh to Nargothrond. Hear the words of the Lord of the water of waters, they said to the king. Thus he spoke to Círdan the shipwright. The evil of the north has defiled the springs of Syrian, and my power withdraws from the fingers of the flowing waters. But a worse thing is yet to come forth. And he talks about, um, uh, he cautions them to close up Nargothron, which they do not do. They do, they do not Build heed. Yep. Yeah. So they ignore Ulmo, always a bad idea. And But it's interesting because it's Ulmo directly. Like he of the Valar, he's the one that keeps that keeps trying to protect people. But we've heard a couple of times that already, that even his protection and his ability to create, um, you know, help the elves create Gondolin, for example, um, he, it's all temporary. And he says it's temporary to Turin. Yeah. And, and he, um, so the reason I bring this up is because what is clearly happening here is we have a tale of this is all part of the long fall of Beleriand as a result of the um, hu hubris of the elves, the, the Noldor mm -hmm. and the power and the evil of Morgoth. We've just read the story of Turin Turinbar and the fall of Nargothrond and the men of Brethel. Um, we're next going to hear about the fall of Doriath and then we're going to hear about the far fall of Gondolin. So this is all part of the arc of a tale of sadness. And so we're looking at a microscope at one part of a tale of sadness. And mm -hmm. so should we expect to find hope in that? Maybe, but not necessarily. It, 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 in a certain part, of, I mean, there's a reason why, and I'm bringing, obviously I'm bringing it up on purpose. There's a reason why people still read Oedipus at Rex and Oedipus at Colonus to this day. It's a tale of utter tragedy. There's a reason that the Greek tragedies of all sorts, not just the Oedipal cycle, are read. And that's because tragedy itself is part of the worthwhile uh, mode of storytelling. It tells, it tells us even by cautionary tale and by other, for other reasons, gives us something worthwhile. Is it hopeful? No, it is not <laughs> in this mm -hmm. case. And so, and so, but the larger arc remains hopeful. And we see, of course, in the end that Morgoth's plans come to naught. But in this particular story, I agree with you. This is a, this one's a downer. Mm. All right. So apparently, Jonathan likes downers. Well. <laughs> Gosh, guys, I can't win. Just because I like <laughs> the story doesn't mean I. Okay, no, I appreciate it. We're story. having we're having fun with you. I know, I know. All right. So next week we're going to move on into uh, of the Rune of Doriath. We'll finish the whole chapter in one week. And I'm sure we'll get under an hour for this next podcast, right, guys? Surely we can do that. <laughs> hey, I'd like to point out, though, that we used to go an hour and a half when there was no subscriber section. And now we go about an hour with no subscriber yeah. section. And then we go. To, so we, we oh, brought not, this on ourselves. 
Oh, oh, but boy, we're not we're not done yet. <laughs> because as we as we close out, we always have to go to if you like Tolkien. All right. So if you like Tolkien, uh, I got something actually from uh, Ravensburger. They sent it to me because they're like, hey, you want this? And I was like, sure, I'll uh, I'll check it out. And here's the funny thing. So what it was or what it, two of these is they sent me uh, puzzles. These, this puzzle of uh, this is of the two towers, and there's another one of the Fellowship of the Ring. And uh, when when my family goes on vacation, uh, we always do a puzzle. Like that's a thing. And so, uh, and You're by awesome. we, I mean pretty much my wife and I. <laughs> so, uh, mm. so uh, my my eldest daughter will actually get involved, and she does a pretty good job too. But um, we went ahead and uh, did this puzzle, and uh, and we really enjoyed it. It's you know, Ravensburger is a good quality puzzle. It was a lot of fun, and uh, we did the let me get this this up here for our viewers um we did the the lord of the rings uh fellowship of the ring puzzle and it was two thousand pieces and there were times wow. where you're like oh my gosh this is gonna take forever but we were able to actually like uh finish the whole thing in about a week's time we, we just we found a space on the floor to do it because there was no table big enough because it's they're pretty huge it's a two thousand piece puzzle uh but yeah it was a lot of fun and it looks pretty good i would say that the fellowship of the ring one looks just a whole lot better than the uh the two towers one i think it's more well constructed and i don't have a picture of the final one i think i do somewhere maybe maybe my wife took it on her phone Ooh, but uh but yeah it almost, looks pretty good almost done and this one. yeah almost done. Awesome. we did finish it we did finish it um but it was it was a lot of fun and so if you want something if you're on vacation i was in south dakota for a couple of weeks for a nice family vacation uh and like i said last week seeing the american argonath in mount rushmore and <laughs> things in the area uh we see right there argonath upper right so uh we did this puzzle in the meantime and that was a lot of fun something to do to keep your mind off like work things and other things of life is just enjoy that's awesome we do the same thing when we, we go to beach a beach house in california and we uh we do always do a puzzle when we're there um i what i like best about this image up on the screen right now is that one of the last pieces left is like all the Nazgul because they're all just black. <laughs> <laughs> so so couldn't find, there's a bunch well, the of black is, pieces. Like, all the colors are the same as like Legolas's color here and then Aragorn's color here and the dwarves. Like the, you can see it's all the, those black areas. We were like, which one does this go in? Where has the, how the, and so we had to eventually like, we like did the whole separated into the types of puzzle pieces so that we could like yep. figure out like, okay, these yeah. three prong versus four prong you, versus you, like. It, you always get down to that when it comes to a big yeah. puzzle. Yeah. So anyway, I recommend it. It's fun if you've got it. They're like thirty between thirty and forty dollars on Amazon. I'll I'll put a link below, but it's the Ravensburger. These were released uh, I, I want to say like a month ago or so, maybe two months ago, uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of fun. So so do that. Uh, grab a puzzle if you're looking for something enjoyable to do that uh, that is kind of brainless until you get super frustrated and you're like I can't find a stupid piece. Fine. All right. Cool. So next week, chapter what is it? Twenty one. Am I right about that? Chapter, let me get to it. 22. So 22. Okay, this is 21. Chapter 22 uh, of the Ruin of Doriath. We'll do the whole thing next week. So thanks for sticking with us, everybody. We're going to move into our extended podcast, which uh, you can get by becoming a patron at theonering.com slash patron. First month is free, as I usually say. Uh, and if you like the podcast, right, since you're still here, you know, get into your podcast app. Give us a five-star rating. It helps us, you know, be found by more people. Gets more interesting questions that we'll have on our uh, extended podcast here, talking more about fate versus uh, um, uh, f doom versus free will versus uh, just bad decisions. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I like this question. Did the man make the curse or the curse make the man? That's an interesting, brief approach to how, like, how is Turin more effective? We've talked about that a little bit, but we'll dive into a little bit more. And then we have a specific question directly from Michael all about Catholics. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So uh, so so yeah. I so go to one, yeah, I'll go to the one ring com slash Peyton and don't be a freeloader anymore. Come join us there, or do and keep yeah. hanging out with yeah. us. It's all right. I'll see you later. We still love you. Bye bye.